This morning, I'm starting a brand new sermon series as we have already concluded last uh, two weeks ago. Uh, This uh, sermon series is entitled Living Beyond Ourselves. Amen? Living Beyond Ourselves. In Philippians chapter, uh, today's message is entitled Investing in the Next Generation. Amen? Investing in the Next Generation. So basically, if you are born, who is born here uh, from 1997 and earlier? Anyone? We have a few. (laughs) With a raise of hands. My wife is raising her hand. (laughs) Praise the Lord. 1997 and earlier, Tim is raising his hand. (laughs) I I mean, earlier in the sense of... um, 1997 up until the present day. (laughs) Amen. They are known as Generation Z. Amen. Uh, This morning, my son, actually, um, my son David on the way here to church, he corrected me and said, Dad, there's a newer generation than Generation Z. It is Generation Alpha. It's the, the newer one. Amen. But one thing that we know is that here in our church, we celebrate our young people. We celebrate our children. And we are able to invest, amen, in the next generation. So join with me in this sermon series. And our sermon series passage is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. And it says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, amen. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the other. Amen? So we're going to see this passage a few more times during this sermon series. Um, But this morning's message is entitled, Investing in the Next Generation. Many of us, if you are not aware or have not really seen it clearly, from the 1980s until the present, there has been enormous amount of change. Do you agree with me? Things have changed. People have changed. Customs and traditions have changed. And I can also say that we have become more and more focused on ourselves. Could you agree with me in that? In fact, in the leisure industry, we have a whole new uh, bursting of the priority of just relaxing ourselves by ourselves. Have you seen that? Technology companies focus on this. Our phone systems today, especially our cell phones, Um, We never had a phone called the iPhone in the past. Today we have one, meaning I, myself. We have what we call selfies. I remember back in the 1980s and uh, and, uh, 1990s, whenever it's picture time, it is so hard to gather people. Have you noticed that? But today, whenever it's picture time, people run to get their (laughs) pictures taken. You know what? I can admit that I am one of those guys. <laughs> uh, today, I love to have my picture taken. In fact, we also ha- like, or, or in our new world, in our new modern world, there is a new word that has been invented that n- before, before the cell phone age, we would think about it as being greedy. This word is called selfie. A selfie is a picture taken of yourself to show others about ourselves. We love to show ourselves, correct? We regard other people important, but today we also like our private time. But let me say this, friends, that as God's people, as the church of Jesus Christ, We have been called to fellowship and koinonia. Amen? In that word koinonia, it means to be called out. Amen? 
to become together and having all things in common. What this means, friends, is that I know we love to spend our own time. We love self-time. But at the same time, we also need to invest time. Especially in others that are around us. Can you say amen to that? Amen? And there is a group of people that I would say that we need to do a lot of investing in. What is that? That is the next generation that will come and follow after a lot of us. Can you say amen? amen? And I am so blessed that here in our church, we have focused a lot of resources, manpower, volunteers, staff, towards the children's ministry of Faith International Fellowship. Last Sunday, it was nice to see Sister Anovic who spearheaded the ministry outdoors. Amen? Uh, she took the time to, uh, while we were having church, to go out there and to minister to our children in the hot sun while we were having service inside. Why? Because we believe in the next generation. Can you say amen to that? I have made a list here, and some of this are actually... Different people or different websites, different groups have different time frames on all of this. Let's look at them. From 1928 to 1945, that group is called the Silent Generation. Who among you here are part of that group? Of course, no one wants to say I am. And then from 1946 to 1964, that is known as the baby boomers. Amen? And once again, no one says, I am part of that. <laughs> and of course, 1965 to 1980, this is known as the Generation X. And from 1981 to 1996, this is known as the Millennials. And from 1997 to the present day, this is known as Generation Z. This is a period of time wherein our children, they are known to be the digital generation. Amen? Some would argue that this particular generation is not only the digital generation, they are the new generation silent generation. So I want to focus this morning in this morning's message in the Gen Z generation. Amen? When you look at the eyes of our children, you see where the future of our church, you see where the future of our country, and you see where the future of the world is going. Do you agree with me? Meaning to say, our children are the next leaders in our church, the next leaders in our nation, the next leaders of the world. Amen? When we see and look at them, we see the future of our nation. Now, let me ask you this. This includes our children today. What does the future look like? How do you see the future with our young ones? This sermon series is entitled, Living Beyond Ourselves. Let me say that this message also speaks to me directly as a parent. This message speaks directly to me as a pastor. This Message speaks directly to me as a leader in the community. Amen? That there is a need to live beyond just ourselves. Amen? And one of the greatest tasks that we have as a church and as parents and as an elder generation 
is the responsibility, can you say amen, of raising up a future generation that will honor God, that will serve God, that will love on God. And let me say that here in our church, we have those. We see it in our young ones. We see it in their desire to be baptized at a young age. We see it in their desire to serve God, to be part of anything that has to be done. Last Sunday, when we got home from church, um, my son was bringing a package, a brown bag package. Inside was what they called chocolate bombs that was made by the young people together with Pastor Omel. It was the first time I've heard of the term. I said, so how does it go? And I got one and, and tried to bite on it. And my son David, no, 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 dad. That's not how it goes. He put it on hot water. And it becomes like a chocolate drink. I was so impressed at our young people. Saturday night, Saturday afternoon, they stayed over here preparing those candies and the message of the empty egg so that it can be used as a tool of ministry the following day. The Bible tells us, friends, in Psalms 145 verse 4, it says here, one generation commends your work to another. Can you say amen to that? One generation. Thank you. One generation commends your work to another. What this means, friends, is that from one generation, they tell of the stories of the Lord. Can you say amen? Our responsibility is to pass on the stories of Christ to the next generation. Now, I'm not just talking here about parenting. I'm talking here about discipleship. I'm talking here about mentoring. And for some of you, I'm talking here about um, grand parenting. Amen? We pass on the stories of Christ to the next generation. What stories? The stories of telling of the mighty acts of Jesus. The stories of the Bible. The stories that commend and share the life of believers in Christ. Can you say amen to that? One of the amazing things about the nation of Israel, even though they did not have a geographical land for close to 2,000 years, is the fact that they passed on their traditions to the generations that followed, even when they did not have a communal land to call their own until 1948. What this means, friends, is a whole nation was preserved even though they were scattered all over the land. Are you with me? A whole nation was preserved because of the tradition of passing on the legacy to the next generation. And in 1948, when they were gathering back into the Holy Land, what's the amazing thing is this. They all had the same thing in common, and there was no deviation from that. Let me say, first and foremost, this is a miracle. It has to be divine by nature. Can you say amen? How could a nation close to 2,000 years all over the world, dispersed all over the world, yet when they came back, they still knew everything as if they did not disperse. That's a miracle. But let me also say that it shows and we can attest to the fact that they taught the generations that followed the very things and the precepts that they have learned from the generation before. I want to see, I know you too, a United States of America, a nation. If you are Filipino, you would say, I want to see a Philippines. If whatever country you come from, you would say, I want to see my nation serve God 
with the generations that follow. I'm only hearing like three amens right now. How do we form that? We form that with the generations and the children that we raise up to love on God, to serve God, to tell them about the precepts and the moral values of a nation that is declining. I want to encourage us to preach the truth. Because one of the things about the church, when we pass on the baton to the next generation, we are in a relay race. Are you with me? We are not in a walk. We are in a relay. And we have to pass on something to the next generation. Not just the traditions of how we cook and how we prepare meals. Can you say amen? amen. That is something I'm teaching my children now as the main cook in our home. But also the values of Christian living and the morality of Christianity. Are you with me? Why? Because Jesus wants to see this. Growing up, there was a song. I don't know exactly what the title is. Maybe it is this. May those who come behind us find us faithful. There, are, there is a big need for us as believers to model to the next generation Christ exemplified. In Mark chapter 10, verse 13, all the way to verse number 16, we find here something that is so amazing. The three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called synoptic because sin means together, being able to have in agreement, and the optic refers to the eyes. They had together seen something with their own eyes, and they became witnesses of it, and they wrote the same stories. Amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke wrote the same stories and recorded these stories. John has some of these stories too, but John, John's gospel was a, for something else and was considered for a different purpose. That's why when you have someone that is just new in the Lord, you recommend the gospel of John. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke usually has the same stories together. And now this story in Mark chapter 10 is a story that is recorded by all three of them. So the question we ask is this, what does Jesus say about the next generation? And this is important because this message is not talking about the parents alone or the older ones, but this is a message about how God considers younger ones. So this message is to encourage our younger generation that God cares for you. Amen? Amen. If you're young here, born from 1997 and earlier, and even if you still consider your, yourself young, older than 1997, let me say, look around this whole place. If you see someone that's a little older than you, God looks at all of you the same way. God is not a picker of persons. Whether you are 70 years old or you are five minutes from birth or being born. God looks at you the same way. Can you say amen? amen. Even within the womb, God looks at you the same way. So if, if you are watching with us or you are physically here right now and you are young, don't ever think that the church is for people who are older and the preacher preaches for people who are older. You are valuable to the Lord just like he cares for each and every one that's here. Amen. Amen. God is no respecter of persons. I am not more valuable to the Lord than you. God loves you the same way. We have different roles, maybe. But when it comes to how God looks at us, he looks at us the same way. So he looks at Jordan the same way. He looks at Anna the same way. He looks at all of our young ones. He looks at Amara the same way. He looks at all of us the same way. Are you with me? Never ever think that because your age is older that God considers you more important than a younger one. 
Are you with me here? So this sermon this morning is to let to, to prop up the young ones, to let them know that God cares for them and loves them so much. The first thing that I'm going to share this morning is, what does Jesus say about the next generation? Number one, Jesus has special attention and love for children. Amen? Jesus has special attention and love for our children. Do you agree with me in that? Amen. Look at this passage, friends, found in Mark chapter 10. We'll start from verse number 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me. Amen. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Continuing on, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Amen? The context of the story here, friends, is Jesus is teaching... And before we run into this particular passage, Jesus is teaching about the marriage relationship, about male and female. Amen? And in this marriage relationship, he touches on the issue of divorce. Are you with me? People were gathered, hundreds of people were gathered, thousands of people were there. His disciples were there. They were following Jesus because he was performing mighty miracles. And there were people who were questioning. The Pharisees were questioning Jesus about the issue of divorce. And of course, Jesus goes ahead and answers that. But let me say this, that in that whole gathering, all of a sudden, parents with little children allow their children to come to him. Are you with me? And then, what does Jesus do? The disciples, let me say that, friends, today we have what we call ushers. Have you been greeted by an usher when you came in today? Amen. Brother Ebot is out there. Brother Wally is out there. They are ushering and making sure that there is what we call proper order inside the church. Amen. Amen. In biblical days, in the time of Jesus, the disciples were ushers. The disciples decided who can come close to Jesus and who cannot. Are you with me? Remember the story of the woman with the issue of blood and she touched the garment of Jesus and the disciples said, don't bother. There are so many people touched you. They're all here. They're all the same. No one special did it. It's the disciples that made sure that Jesus was able to do his task. And here we find in Mark chapter 10, the disciples telling Jesus, Jesus, or, or they, they were getting the children and putting them aside and not letting them come to Jesus because he has more important things to do. Let me say, friends, Jesus loves and pays a lot of attention to the children of the world. Amen? That's why it's nice to see when we have feeding programs. It's nice to see when we have ministries that care for the young ones of the world. Why? Because Jesus cares for them. And here we find that Jesus was indignant and he was mad and he was frustrated. Why? Because children are important to Jesus. Children are also a blessing. Amen? Let's look at this, friends, in Psalms 127, verse number 3. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Can you say amen to that? Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring a reward from Him. What does Jesus think about children? He thinks that they're special and important. Amen? Amen? He thinks that you are valuable in the eyes of God. 
as a young pastor, I've seen a lot of parents who struggle because they could not have children. And we pray alongside with them and lift them up and hold their hand in these moments of terrible grief. I have seen also parents losing children and perform funerals in situations like this. It is very difficult. But one thing, friends, is that children are always a blessing to be around. Here in our church, we welcome children. Here in our church, we put priority in the ministry of children. We love on children. We invest finances. The church eldership puts a lot of emphasis on the ministries of younger ones. Resources, finances, and staffing for that specific purpose. Why? Because we see the value of hearts that can be molded and changed. Amen? Children are a blessing. Now let me say, can children be exhausting? Ask Anavik. She teaches children's church. Ask Raquel who teaches children's church. Ask Gigi, she teaches children's church. They can be exhausting. Ask a parent. They know how difficult it is to have children and to raise them up. One of the things that I dreaded as a dad growing up was when my children were not feeling well. When they were sick, I was also sick, even though I did not have any symptoms of sickness. When our children don't feel good, you don't feel good. Correct? That's right. But another thing that I also dreaded is when my son or daughter would say, Daddy, I have poo-poo. I don't know about you, but I dreaded those times. I am fortunate and blessed that they don't have that anymore. And I'm looking forward to grandfathership, wherein whenever they have poo-poo, I will just give it to mom and dad. I guess I can't escape. <laughs> Toddler's rules. Number one, if you want it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it away from you, it's mine. If I had a little while, if I had it a little while ago, it's mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. If we are building something together, all the pieces are mine. If it just looks like mine, it's mine. If I think it's mine, it's mine. If I give it to you and change my mind later, it's still mine. Once it's mine, it will never belong to anyone else, no matter what. But if it's broken, it's yours. Now, children are moldable. One of the first words that children can say, aside from mom, Papa, Mama, is the word mine. Children can be trained. The Bible says to train up a child in a way he should go. That when he becomes old, he will not depart from it. I am blessed that I have a wonderful, beautiful, loving, and caring wife. And we have two beautiful and loving, caring children. I love them so much. And I don't believe in spending time. I believe in investing time. Spending time is letting time pass by. But when we invest time, it is time that is well spent. Amen? Jesus pays close attention to children. Number two, Jesus wants children to come to him. Can you say amen? Amen. Look at this in verse number 14. The Bible says, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the children come to me. Amen? And do not hinder them. Can you say amen to that? Now let me say this, friends. If you are here and you don't have children, this can also apply to anyone that we know who is Somehow distant from the Lord. Let them come to the Lord. 
Amen? Be a mentor. Be a guide to someone. Be a discipler and a coach. Are you with me? One of the blessings about being able to, uh, to uh, for me as a pastor, being able to have time because this is a dedication that I have as a minister, I can call people up and minister to people and coach people and guide people as a pastor. I do that a lot. And it's a blessing when we can transform lives and we can shape lives for the glory of the Lord. Can you say amen? This is what God wants. Jesus wants children to come to him. Jesus wants us to become an influence to others. Jesus wants everyone to come to him. Amen? That includes you. And that includes me. I would say to all of us that are here, if you have children, and to our online community that's watching with us, do not be a hindrance to your children's salvation. As a parent, do not be the cause why our children will not serve God. If our children says, Dad, Mom, I want to go to church, you better get up and go to church. Are you with me? Why? Because you don't want the children to think that it's okay not to come to church, especially when they're the ones who want to come to church. Amen? Be excited about it. What does Jesus want to do with our children? Look at this. In, in verse number 16 of the same passage. And he looked. My eyes are not seeing well. Part of reaching 40. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. What does Jesus do? He comes. He takes them by his hand. Amen. Places his hands on them. Are you with me? And he blessed them. He blessed them. One of the blessings that I have living in our home with an extended family is that I have my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law living with us. Amen? I am so excited and blessed by my mother-in-law. Why? Whenever she wakes up in the morning, she opens the window and she lifts up her hand and, and looks out in the window and starts blessing God. Amen? When our children wake up, she starts blessing our children. When she opens the door, she blesses before going out. Amen? When someone leaves the house, she prays for them and blesses them. And she says, God bless you. When someone comes and buys chorizo, before she even opens the door, she already prays as she walks out. That's just her heart. She loves to bless. And this is something that we as God's people can do. We can embrace. We can be a blessing to others. We can bless our children. And this is something that personally I need to work on. But we as God's people can work on this. Because why? Jesus himself is a hugger. This is the verse in verse number 16. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. What does he do? He, he doesn't say, oh, can I shake your hand? Can I be six feet away from you? He comes to them and hugs children. Oh, friends, let me say this, friends. That when we get to heaven when we pass on from this life if you are in Christ you know what when Jesus sees you he's not going to say okay social security number bap 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 no he calls you by name and then he does not only extend his hand towards you he comes and hugs you and embraces you and he says well done my good and faithful servant Jesus is a hugger now, let me say this, friends, because in our community, in our society right now, uh, when we talk about men hugging children, there's this bad connotation towards that. But let me say this, friends. God is a lover to his people. Men are evil, but God is good. Amen? Hallelujah. 
Jesus had open arms. He embraced these children and loved on them. You know why? Because Jesus wants children to come to him. We say, not just words, but deeds. Let me also say, not just words, but hugs. Amen? Not just what we say, but we need to do it. Friends, we may become the Jesus with skin on to others today. We may be the closest ministry to them. We may be someone in the workplace who's able to minister to someone who's there. Who's going through a very difficult time in their life. You could be someone who can be Jesus to them when they're going through this most difficult times in their lives. The Bible talks about greeting. And this word greeting is an embrace in the scriptures. In fact, in the New Testament, they embraced by giving kisses. Now, let me say that we today, we feel awkward doing this. But if you go to the Middle East, you go to places where the Bible is written from, they love to kiss one another. There's no malice in that. Today, what we do is we shake hands, right? We show affection and relationship by a handshake. Let me say, we can also show friendship and relationship by a hug. With COVID-19 and social distancing, a lot of that has changed recently. Amen? And that's okay. But you know, friends, a time's going to come, we still have to continue doing that. Because why? The scriptural model... Not the societal model, but the scriptural model of fellowship is togetherness in one place. The Bible says, forsake not the assembly of God's people. Amen? What this means is we, we have to continue meeting together and embracing one another in the love of the Lord. And especially, let me say, let us not disregard in any way the younger and the next generation in our affection and in our love as a church. Because why? Jesus wants them to come to him. Amen? Not only does Jesus want them to come to him, Jesus wants to bless children. Amen? Amen? Jesus wants to bless them. In fact, in the verse before, in verse number 16, we found out that Jesus' uh, children were placed in his arms and placed his hands on them and blessed them. Blessing. Amen? In the secular world, when we talk about blessing, it talks about giving something financially. In fact, it's not the word bless, it is an inheritance. But in the kingdom of God, not only is blessing something that is given materially, words can become a blessing. Are you with me? So what we say to someone is important regarding the blessing that we give someone. I know it's nice to bless someone with a gift. Can you say amen? We have been recipients and we also have been givers of material gifts. But friends, there is a kind of blessing that comes forth from the mouth. Are you with me? And this is what Jesus did. He did not only embrace them with his arms, but he blessed them. He spoke words to them. The nation of Israel in Numbers chapter 6, which is known as the priestly blessing we sing about this but let's look at verse number 22 first verse 22 says the lord said to moses this is god saying to moses tell aaron and his sons meaning to say god told moses this is what you gotta tell your high priest this is what you gotta tell your high priest and his sons who are 
functioning in that capacity. This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Are you with me? So how are they going to bless the Israelites? By giving them stimulus checks? That would be nice, right? But there's something better. God tells Moses to tell Aaron and his sons, say to them, it's the words. Are you with me? If you want to bless, say something good. Amen? Look at these words. What is this words? We sing this. I love the, the lyrics and the music behind this. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. That's what God was telling Moses to tell Aaron and Aaron and his children to tell the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let me say, friends, that this is still continues to be a priestly prayer in the nation of Israel up to this point. It is something that they do on a regular basis, knowing that there is power in declaring a blessing over the next generation. So in, 19, uh, in, in A.D. 70, somewhere around that time, 71 or 72, when Israel uh, and, uh, and Jerusalem was completely destroyed, and when they were dispersed throughout the whole world, they continued to do this. They would lay their hands on their children, even without a high priest, and they will say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. When they regathered in 1948, they all knew number 6, 24 to 26. Are you with me? Look at this. Because there's a verse 27. So they will put my name. This is Jehovah speaking to Moses to tell Aaron. This is the result if you say verse 24 to 26. So they will put my name on all the Israelites. Who will put his name on all the Israelites? Aaron and his children. Are you with me? God told Moses to tell Aaron and his children to say this. So that they will put my name on all the Israelites and I will bless them. You want to put God's name on our children and the next generation? Declare God's blessing over them. Amen. Declare God's blessing over our children. Declare God's blessing over the, the younger generation that is following after us. Honor them. Love them. Show them God's way. Bless them. Be, be a blesser because our God is a blesser to our children. We need to pray for the favor of our children and the generations that are to come. Because every child is special in God's eyes. Amen? Declare it. So when we form our children, when we form our, our younger ones, we don't only teach them the traditions of our heritage. We don't just teach them how to cook adobo. We teach them the name. We place the name of God in their hearts. Amen? If you are a grandparent, just lay your hands on your children before they go, before, before they leave your house, if they don't live with you, just do this. If you're a parent, be able to minister to your children and lift them up and say words of encouragement to them. Because why? There is power when we bless the next generation. We invest in the next generation that is to come. Amen. Number four. Jesus wants us to have a heart for and of children. Not only for the children, but God actually says, okay, if you're a little older, have the heart of a child. Are you with me? 
Sometimes we want children to have our heart. We tell our children, follow the ways of my heart, but God wants us to have a childlike attitude. Childlike heart. Amen? The Bible says, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. Jesus wants us to have a heart for and of children. Amen? Statistics. Almost half of all Born again, experienced people today trusted in Jesus when they were 13 years old. Let me repeat that again. Almost half of all people who are born again today got born again. When they were 13 or younger in age. Jesus is true when he says if anyone, uh, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like this little child will never enter it. The, the older we get, the more stubborn we become in our heart. That's the truth. Are you with me? Look at this. Not only is the age 13 important, but also the age 23. It says, less than 25% come to the Lord at the age of 23 and older. How old did you come to know the Lord? How old have you received Jesus Christ? Are you one of the exceptions here? Praise the Lord for that. But let me say, statistically speaking, more or almost half of those who serve God today became a Christian before they reached the age of 13. That gives us a reminder as ministers and as a church of how valuable it is to minister, to mold the younger generation and to invest in the next generation that is to come. Our church is committed to children and young families. I am looking forward to the time that as we begin to, con to continue reopening that we can have a children's ministry back operational. Somehow safely done but yet it still has to happen. Why? Because God loves the little children. Our children go to school every day of the week. It's just one day on a Sunday. Maybe this is something that we need to begin considering to a ministry on a regular basis as we continue to regather and open up as a church. Why? Because our children are so important to be molded at a young age. It is there where things happen. I remember, friends, when I first got uh, saved, that was in July 8, 1991. I'm part of the 13 age group bracket here. Gave my life to the Lord. I cried out to Jesus. I came forward. Came to the front. It was a Wednesday evening. The preacher was preaching. But that didn't matter. It was someone that was beside me who said, Hey, they're calling you up there. They didn't really call my name. But he helped emphasize the tugging of the Spirit of God to come forward. I went to the front. I got prayed for. I fell 
on the floor and cried for the next 45 minutes. When I got out of that floor, this man became my best friend. Amen? Before the age of 13. Something else happened too. We make mistakes and we fall. We, but yet there is a recovery. And God is able to restore us and change us and put us back. But friends, the greatest impact in our lives happen when we're young. Amen? Youth conventions, gatherings of young people, children's camps and youth camps. These are the things that form and mold the generation that is to come. This is when the calling of many are affirmed into full-time ministry. This is when people decide to make their lives uh, count for the kingdom of God and they will commit into a Bible college or into a place where they can serve God because they received the call of God at a young age. Do not hinder children from coming to Him. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as, as this. Let us all stand. In closing, friends, what is it about becoming like a child? Number one, the soft heart. At the very core of it all, God wants us to have a soft heart. Not only a soft heart, but a humble heart. There was a story of a dad who was telling his child, Son, there is no God. The thing that you learn in VBS, that's not true. There is no God. And the father was trying to convince his son so much that there was no God. Eventually, his son says, Dad, do you think when we get to heaven, that, uh, God will remember that we had this conversation? The point is this, friends. Children cannot be convinced that there is no God. You tell them a story, they will believe. You tell them that Santa Claus is real, they believe that Santa Claus is real and he's the one putting the gifts in the socks. But friends, there is a better discipleship than telling them about these myths. It is about telling them about the gospel and about the life that they can have that is found in Jesus. That we are God's people, that we can train up the younger ones in the ways of the Lord, that they can serve God. The Bible says, unless you become like one of them, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for our young people. Lord, we say, oh God, that we want to invest in them. Lord, it starts not in the church. It starts in the home. And Lord, it starts with us. It starts with me. And Father, we pray that you will guide us as parents and as leaders in our families. And Lord, not only leaders in our families, but leaders in our community, leaders in our churches, leaders in a nation. I pray that we will be able to train up and disciple the next generation to follow after you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for our church and for the ministry of coaching, mentorship, discipleship, monitoring, guiding, hands-on training that we're doing. I pray that you will help each and every one of us Help us as leaders. Help us as ministers. Help us as guides. And Lord, we also recognize that not only children, but we can be an influence to people all around us. We have workplaces. We have family settings. We have gyms to go to. 
And Lord, markets to buy food. I pray that you will use us as ministers for your glory and for your honor. We thank you for the gift of investment. Lord, we pray that you will bless our children. Amen. If you are a parent right now and, and there is someone, younger one that's close to you, just extend your hand to them at this very moment. Amen. If there are those who are, once again, in the bracket of 1997 and earlier. Amen. Let's lift them up. Let's pray for them. Amen. Father, we just lift up our children to you. We know that they are precious in your sight. We know, Lord, that you don't care whether we are black or white, whatever color we have, oh God. You are no respecter of person, and you love us the same. I pray that you will bless each of our young ones today. I pray that you will touch them. And may you, Lord Jesus Christ, bless them. And make your face shine upon them. And Lord, give them your peace. And Lord, may you continue to show your grace, O oh God, in their lives, in their schools, whether they are going in person or online. I pray that you will bless them be with them. I pray for the future of our country and our nation. It's in the hinges of our children. I pray, Lord, that they will choose you and not the world. I pray that they will seek you and not the world. I pray, Lord, when they go to college, they will not forsake their first love. I pray for our young ones. We lift them up to you, and we ask that you will bless them. Bless our church, Faith International Fellowship, and all the work that we do for your glory and for your honor. We thank you, and we ask, Lord, that you alone will get all the glory and all the credit. We thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.